The greatest minds in history have long suspected that the brain has the incredible ability to suppress your memories, but it is only in recent years that the way that the brain achieves this has finally been discovered. The topic of memory suppression almost always focuses upon the most extreme scenarios, namely the repression of the most deeply traumatic memories, such as those which feature violence or abuse, dangerous accidents, or the traumatic loss of a loved one. But the reality is that memory suppression is actually a rather commonplace neurological activity, in which our brains actively suppress our memories on a day-to-day -day basis, to the point that we forget most of our experiences. An obvious advantage of this suppression is that it enables the brain to preserve its storage space. However, in addition to the big advantage of memory conservation, there are also many other advantages too. One such advantage is the suppression of outdated memories, such as memories of where you had previously parked your car, in order to make it easier for you to remember where you parked it today. Another prominent example is the repression of embarrassing social moments to protect your self-esteem, as well as the suppression of memories of failure in order to increase your self-confidence. Finally, another example is the suppression of memories, which feature the unpleasant actions of loved ones to restore the health of a relationship after an argument. These are just a few examples of everyday memory suppression, which operate ubiquitously and which shape our perception throughout our lives, without us even really noticing. So to summarise, whilst this suppression has a critical role for enabling healthy brains to conserve space and to use updated information, but it also ensures that we do not spend inordinate amounts of time ruminating on bad memories or negative thoughts thereby preventing you from self-destruction. But how are memories actually suppressed by the brain? Despite the mysticism of memory suppression within psychology, the brain mechanism which underlies memory suppression is actually surprisingly straightforward. But to understand this, we must first take a look at two other important processes called memory formation and recall. Whenever you experience something that your brain wants to remember later, a part of your brain activates, which is called the hippocampus. Your hippocampus is essential for forming conscious memories, and it activates alongside other cortical areas of your brain, which are also involved in processing the experience that you are having. Here, the new memory is then contained and subsequently stored in unique representations within the hippocampus, as well as across the cerebral cortex. Later, when these new memories are then remembered, the hippocampus then reactivates. However, the hippocampus then also reactivates the same cortical areas which were originally activated during the original experience. This memory recall process is called memory reinstatement, and it involves activation of cortical regions like sensory areas in order to kind of simulate the memory, enabling you to re-experience it. This is why your hippocampus is so important for recalling memories. But now let's turn to memory suppression. You have a very important region in your brain called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or DLPFC. This is a region that resides within the left and rightmost sides of your upper forehead, and it is a fascinating region because it is important for general inhibitory control, meaning that it helps to stop undesired behaviours or cognitive processes from actually being completed within your brain, including stopping your memories from being remembered. In the case of memory inhibition, the DLPFC provides the brakes on unwanted memory recall by directly inhibiting the hippocampus. This thereby prevents the hippocampus from activating, and therefore prevents the memory representations across the cortex from being reinstated. Consequently, the memory is successfully suppressed, and together, this process is called suppression-induced forgetting. And what is incredible about this process is that each time you attempt to suppress a memory, this suppression makes that memory that bit more permanently inaccessible. 
This is because this kind of mental stop button weakens the unique underlying neural representations which form that particular memory. Furthermore, this memory suppression is achieved in a rather meticulous way, through the targeting of an additional brain region within the brain's overall memory network. This additional region is called the parahippocampal cortex, or PHC. Here, the PHC and the hippocampus together share quite similar functions. Whilst your hippocampus is important for reinstating and accessing the overall memory, your PHC instead appears to play a more specific role in recalling the finer details of the memory, and that the more vivid that your memory is, and the more details that you can remember about it, the more that your parahippocampal cortex is activating. And as you might therefore imagine, during this process of suppression-induced forgetting, the DLPFC therefore also targets the PHC, consequently impairing your ability to recall these finer details. This may be why we often have the ability to recall the overall gist of what happened during a memory, but are often unable to remember the exact specifics, especially as more time passes between now and when the memory was created. Because whilst hippocampal memory may be preserved to whatever extent, parahippocampal cortex memory may not. Together this suggests that forgetting, whether intentional or unintentional, is in fact a graded process, one which may be facilitated by differential levels of suppression of these different medial temporal regions by the DLPFC. However, despite the numerous advantages that are gained in this process of suppressing memories, some people unfortunately struggle in this process. Which brings us to the next section. There is plenty of diversity amongst the population, in terms of people's ability to suppress their memories as found within a paradigm called the Think-No-Think no Think test, which has investigated memory suppression during the last 20 years. Here, participants are instructed in the experiment to suppress their memories, whilst their brains are being scanned, typically by using fMRI. Here, neuroscientists report that people not only claim to have differing levels of ability to suppress their unwanted memories, but they also differ in the strength of suppression that their DLPFC has over their hippocampus and parahippocampal cortex, which predicts their susceptibility to obsessional thinking, anxiety and depression. And indeed, there is a crucial link between a failure in memory suppression on the one hand and a tendency for rumination on the other. Here, rumination is a kind of repetitive thinking about negative things, and rumination is known to actively interfere with memory suppression and can even generate memory intrusion. And in addition to this, people differ in their susceptibility to developing another disorder called post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, after experiencing a traumatic event. This is a disorder which is characterised by intrusive memories, in the form of flashbacks, and it is therefore unsurprising that people diagnosed with PTSD have been found to recover faster from it, if they have a bigger DLPFC, and may also be less likely to develop PTSD in the first place as a result of having a stronger inhibitory system, not just within the DLPFC, but in broader areas of the prefrontal cortex. But you can find out more about that in other videos.